I'm also fun. Okay. So, qual you know, quality over quantity, right? <laughs> yeah, both. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is an interesting topic. I'll continue with it. It's um, we were asked to, to speak on this subject by a supporter of ours, and we found a material from heaven concerning it, and it turns out to be of some significance and of interest concerning the connection between um, Moses and Joshua. So, getting back to what we are speaking of, we have this parallelism between Moses and Joshua and the future Messiah, son of David, and uh, the Messiah, son of Joseph. And we mentioned that the very style of the books of Deuteronomy, the last books of the five books of Moses, and the uh, book of Joshua, which comes after it, they're similar to each other and they reflect each other. We were asked by a, a friend of ours, by a supporter of Britain, to write something on the on the transition, on the transition between Moses and Joshua. Moses was the leader of the of the Israelite nation. Moses was the one who redeemed, or the emissary of God Almighty, through whom Israel was redeemed from Egypt when they came out of Egypt in the time of the Exodus. And that, in effect, was the foundation of the Israelite nation as we know it, as it appears in the Bible. Well, then you had the patriarchs. You had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then you had Joseph and, and his brothers, and they all come down to Egypt. But even so, they're coming out of Egypt, and after coming out of Egypt, the giving of the Torah was the thing that made uh, the Israelite nation as a nation as we know it now, or as we knew it afterwards. And so this is quite important. Moses was the leader of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt and he led them through the wilderness and they received the Torah whilst Moses was in charge of them and after Moses came Joshua and Joshua already in the time of Moses already had begun to serve as the second in command of Moses and after that he took over so uh, Joshua the son of Nun was the second in command of Moses and he took over and we can learn uh, something about the Israelites and about what happened through the, the uh, relationship between the two. So first of all, we should uh, go back to the very beginning. The, the books of Moses and the book of Joshua. What does that mean, the books of Moses and the books of Joshua? The books of Moses are the first books of the Bible. The books of Moses, five books of the Moses, five books of Moshe Rabbeinu, as my, uh, Moses a teacher, they are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these five books are known in Latin as the Pentateuch, Pentateuch, the five books. And in uh, Hebrew, they're known as the Torah. Torah means teaching. And uh, uh, the, these five books are, are referred to as the Torah. But this can be confusing because the word Torah in Hebrew also means teach and not uh, give instruction. The, and uh, so the whole of Judaism, the whole of, Ju of the Bible, the whole of everything around it is also referred to in general, general terms as Torah. Whereas Torah also specifically means the Chumash, that is the five, the five books of Moses. And they are the first books of the Bible and they were given by Moses and they are considered the most holy, the most authoritative of all the books as if to say the most those books that were given most directly from a divine source. Uh, and uh, they're known as the Torah. The last book of the Torah is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in Hebrew, uh, Deborim, is the last book of the Torah. And the five books. And uh, after Deuteronomy, we have the, the beginning of the books of the prophets. The first book of the prophets is Joshua. And uh, Joshua was traditionally written by Joshua himself, or at least most of it was written by Joshua himself. And it, it contains many uh, expressions and also the whole style and the, the, the whole build of the book, the whole uh, atmosphere of the book. It's very similar to that of Deuteronomy, which is fitting because it, it in effect it is speaking of something that followed on from uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy's last book of the five books of Moses, 
speaks of the death of Moses, and then Joshua takes over in the book, in the book of Joshua. And so Joshua, in effect, is something of a continuation of Deuteronomy. Moses and Joshua, they parallel the Messiah son of David and the Messiah son of Joseph. Joshua died at the age of 110, and uh, so did Joseph. Joshua, Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, was, Ephraim is the son of Joseph, so jo Joshua, Joshua is connected to Joseph. Whereas Moses was from the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi is connected to that of Judah, is connected to that of Judah, and uh, the uh, Levites, most of the tribe of Levites were to be together, were to be together with Levi in the kingdom of Judah. What happened when the ten tribes separated from from Judah, from the kingdom of Judah, set up their own kingdom? The Levites were existed throughout the land of Israel in the scattered settlements. And but King Jeroboam, the leader of the ten tribes, of so the kingdom of Israel in the north, he set up golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, and he told the people to worship them, and he also appoint, appointed non-Levites, people not from the tribe of Levite, to be priest officiates. And because of this, the uh, it says that all of the tribe of Levi, or most of the tribe of Levi, they moved, they moved from there to the kingdom of Judah. So therefore, the kingdom of Judah contained and encompassed within its borders most of the tribe of Levi. So, so they may be associated with Judah. Also Jeremiah. Jeremiah speaks of the end times when uh, it seems that uh, the Levites and the house of David, remember the house of David was from Judah, but he speaks of a time in the, in the future, in the end times, when the Levites and the house of David will be associated with each other. Jeremiah 33, 14 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and in that time I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which he shall be called. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, and to sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that too there will not be night and day in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven, cannot be numbered, nor the sound of the sea measured, so will I multiply the descendants of David my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. So we see from this that David and the Levites are, are associated, or will be associated in the end times, and historically they were associated with each other. And what is the point of all this? Because Moses, we saw the association of Moses with Joshua. Joshua was the, was the, the administrator, the, the stand-in, the the second in command to Moses. When Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, Moses was from the tribe of Levi, but we saw how Levi has some type of parallelism, similarity to Judah. And therefore, you could say that Moses was a prototype of the Messiah, son of David, who will come at the end times. The Messiah, son of David, will come at the end times. He will be from the tribe of Judah. And he will be preceded, preceded by the Messiah, son of Joseph. And we see, we will find a parallelism. There's a parallelism between these two individuals as prototypes of the Messiah, son of Joseph, and the Messiah, son of David. But in tradition, the Messiah, son of, of Joseph, the order will be reversed. In, like, just as in the past, chronologically, first came Moses, then came Joshua. In the end times, first will come the Messiah, son of Joseph, and then after him will come the Messiah, son of David. 
we have this parallelism between Moses and Joshua and the future Messiah son of David and uh, the Messiah son of Joseph. And we mentioned that the very style of the books of Deuteronomy, the last books of the five books of Moses, and the, the book of Joshua, which comes after it, they are similar to each other, and they reflect each other. Moses will be the a prototype of the Messiah son of David, and the Messiah son of David, according to tradition, will be very great, almost as great as Moses was, but Moses will be still the greater of the two. Deuteronomy 34, it says, Deuteronomy 34.10, since there has not arisen an Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants and all his land, and by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel, so that it is been understood to say that there will never be a prophet greater than Moses, and there never was, and there never will be. So that is a point worth noting. And even the Messiah, son of David, in the end times, he will not be greater than Moses was. So coming to that, we should now get to who was Joshua, who was Joshua, the son of Nun. Joshua, the son of Nun, I, I, about his name, Joshua means that God will save son of Nun. Nun was a, in the name of his father, but Nun has uh, different meanings. Different meanings, Nun in Aramaic means fish. It also and uh, it also means rule. The, uh, the ruler, a ruler in the Aramaic, and also in Old Hebrew. The Old Hebrew is very often very similar to the Aramaic. It also connotes rulership, so that is probably the real meaning of it. But as I said, Aramaic can also mean fish, so that is a point of a, 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 an anecdote, an in interesting anecdote. An anecdote. I'm talking about an anecdote, Paul. An anecdote, Paul, here. Uh, an anecdote, Paul, I once knew uh, a, 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 a rabbi, a rabbi, I knew a rabbi, he's uh, in, uh, the, the uh, rabbi of the township of Shiloh. He's a member of a rabbinical family. Uh, his name is Ben Nun. The name of the family is Ben Nun. So I once asked him, how do they get their name? This was uh, 20, 30 years ago, a long time ago. So I asked him, where did his name come from? So he told me his family comes from Germany, they were Jews in Germany. And their name in Germany was Fischer. In other words, someone who is occupied with fish. Sells fish, uh, fishes, I don't know, somehow or other, something to do with his occupation, concerned fish. And in Aramaic, also, possibly in Old Hebrew, the word for fish is Nun. Same as Yahushua, the son of Nun. So therefore, and the name of Yahushua means, uh, Yahushua ben Nun means uh, Yahushua, the son of Nun. So therefore, they translated, they uh, changed their name to Ben Nun to make it sound more Hebrew. So that illustrates uh, the, an etymological point, but uh, the name Yoshua bin Nun probably means son of a ruler. Nun also connotes rulership. It's in, uh, it's, uh, in Psalms, it mentions connection with David, it has this verbal point, this verbal construct. So the name Yoshua most likely, most likely originally meant the son of the ruler. And it was just incidentally also similar to the word for fish, or a word for fish, meaning fish. So getting back to what we're talking now, about to discuss a little bit about Joshua, who was Joshua. Joshua is first mentioned in the Bible as the commander of Israelite forces, who Moses told to choose warriors and to go to war against Amalek, the arch enemy of Israel. See Exodus 17.9. And uh, after that, we again hear of Joshua. When Moses went up to Sinai to receive the Torah, when Moses went up to the mountain to receive the, the Torah, Joshua, Joshua accompanied him, and apparently waited at the bottom of the mountain whilst uh, Moses went up and received the Torah. So that is the second time we hear of Joshua. After that, we had the sin of the golden calf. 
and uh, God was angry with the Israelites. Moses was also angry with them. And Moses separated himself from the people and mostly stayed in the tabernacle. But now and again he would go out and talk to the people and instruct them. But it says that Joshua, the the uh, attendant, Anna, used the word Na, meaning uh, uh, apprentice, standing, the second in command even, uh, would stay in the tabernacle. It says, Anna, Joshua did not move from the temple, not move from the tent from the tent of the tabernacle. And we are told in Exodus 33, 11, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, a young man did not depart from the tabernacle. He wasn't really young. He was about 80 years at the time. Here the word uh, translated as young man means uh, a, second, a secondary uh, of a secondary rank. Here it means uh, the deputy in command, the the deputy minute, prime minister in effect, uh, quite a high rank, but uh, compared to Moses, he was uh, secondary. Originally the name of Joshua, meaning God saves, and jo Hosea, like the the uh, like uh, the prophet Hosea, the same name, and it means almost the same. But Moses changed it to Joshua for reasons known to himself. And later, uh, Joshua is one of the twelve tribes sent to spy out the land of Canaan prior to its conquest. They chose twelve spies, one from every tribe, and they sent them into Canaan to spy it out before they came into conquer conquer it. And ten of the spies came back with a negative report. Only the only Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim and Caleb from the tribe of Judah came back with favorable reports. And this too has significance in the end times. This too has significance in the end times. What is it part of its significance in our time? We identify we identify Ephraim with the British. Or with the Britain and America, it depends upon the context. And Judah, Judah with the Jewish people. And we see that only the spies from the tribes of Ephraim and the tribes of Judah came back with a favorable report about the land. And it was the English, it was the British, the British more than anyone else, who were most... Uh, most active, most dynamic in spreading the the idea of restoration. Restoration means Zionism. The idea of restoration means to return the Jews to the Holy Land, to the land of Israel. And there were Christians in England for more than 400 years. Here and there, there were not that many, but they existed. And over the, over the time, they kept on pushing and pushing and pushing the, the, the idea until they had quite a following. And uh, not only uh, had quite a following in the numbers, but especially in quality. A lot of uh, high-ranking people, important people, influential people, also became convinced of this, of the idea that to return the Jews to the Holy Land. And for some of them, actually, a lot of them depends from the, uh, very from one stage to another, had the idea that they should return the Jews to the Holy Land in order that, to convert them to Christianity. But this was not the motive for all of them, it was never the motive for all of them. And even those who wanted this, they didn't make it a priority. It's more like a wishful thought that maybe it would be easier, maybe they would be able to convert the Jews to Christianity if they're all in one place and if they're in a better situation than they were then. And this movement known as Estorationism, several books written about it, we have researched it a little bit somewhat. We have found that it's quite an interesting study. And this idea of Nestorationism preceded uh, modern Zionism, Zionism in its modern form. It did not precede uh, Zionism in its classical form. There were always Jews throughout history who tried to get back to the Holy Land and set up, set up uh, townships, set up uh, farms. This is, this is a known. There were always Jews trying to do that. 
And even the Jews throughout the, the diaspora, even very poor Jews in Poland and Russia, who hardly had nothing to, nothing to eat, it was a family tradition to put a little bit aside to help the Jews in the land of, of, uh, in the land of, uh, of Israel, what became the land of Israel, the Holy Land. And uh, there were also religious Jews who tried to organize some type of political movement that would uh, hasten things along. But it really got gone after Theodor Herzl and other modern secular type Jews uh, took it over, also adopted the idea and used more modern methods to convert, to uh, talk to the relevant people and try and get things moving, that they did get things moving. And they, they, uh, they helped create the State of Israel and they helped bring about the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was uh, was an obligation, not an obligation, a declaration of intention by the British Empire to establish in this land of Israel, was then known as Palestine, a national home for the Jewish people. And this was, and the British did do it. And the British, despite differences of opinion as to what happened, they did help the Jews, there have been studies done on this, whole books written on it. On the whole, they did help the Jews much more than anything else. And they enabled the Jews to establish the State of Israel. Even though there was a period towards the end, and even before then, amongst the Jewish administrators, there were always those who were against the idea, those who were intended to be even anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, who favoured the Arabs or disliked the Jews, and even tried to backfire, to, to work against the whole project. On the whole, the British were overwhelmingly in favour of it, despite everything. And even those who were against it, in effect, did more to help put it, uh, bring it forward than anything else, until eventually the state of Israel was, did come into being. And it came into being by the skin of its teeth. It was um, immediately attacked by it by Arabs, by a host of Arab nations from all around, together with the rebellion of the Arabs living in the area. And uh, many predicted, believed that it would be destroyed, but it wasn't. They, they managed to overcome their enemies with the help of God. And so that is how it went. This does not never negate the fact that the British helped a lot, helped a lot in practice more than anyone else. And so we should not take credit away from them for what they did do. So what I was saying that uh, in this case you had, in this case you had, in this case you had elements from Ephraim, that is the British, and Judah working to rebuild the land, to resettle the land. And this parallels Moses and Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim and Caleb from the tribe of Judah who were in favour of rebuilding, of rebuilding the land whereas the other tribes were not. After the Jews managed to establish the state of Israel, they were also helped at first by the French and then by the Americans. And the Americans also more or less took over, they took the place of the British and, and, even, and until today. And they, they too are wavering, they too have anti-Zionist anti elements in their administration was sometimes uh, even the presidents are against, against the state of Israel and they try and, uh, and uh, do things against it but somehow or other they always work out even against their better judgment and helping the state of Israel exist and they continue to function and this is the reality that we live with which in effect also reflects what is happening what will happen also in the, in the future, that the Messiah, son of Joseph, will begin to lead the ten tribes back. The sign the son of Joseph will apparently be from the tribe of Joseph. Most opinions say he'll be from the tribe of Ephraim. Some say from the tribe of Manasseh, but the overwhelming opinion is that he will be from the tribe of Ephraim. Some say that he himself will physically be a descendant of jo Joshua, Joshua ben Nun. Another opinion says he will be a, a physical descendant of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first leader of the ten tribes. When the ten tribes separated, when the ten tribes separated from the house of David, in the time of Rehoboam, the son of King Solomon, they separated and they set up their own kingdom in the north, known as the kingdom of, of Israel. 
also known as Samaria, also known as Joseph of Rome, depending on the context. So this kingdom, the first kingdom, was known as Jer was Jeroboam, Jeroboam the son of Nabat. And there is opinion that the Messiah, son of Joseph, who will come to lead the ten tribes back or initiate the return, will be the son of Jeroboam. And by doing this, in the end times, he will, as you to say, be correcting, be rectifying the sin of his forefather Jeroboam, who led the, the revolt and, the, and caused the division between Judah and Joseph. And he will initiate the reunion. And well, we'll see, we'll wait and see. No one, my money is said, no one knows how these things will turn out until they do. But there are all types of opinions, differences of opinions. But if you look at them, they all more or less uh, uh, concentrate, come together on the one thing. And a lot of them uh, are beginning to be fulfilled before our eyes, so there's something in it. So this is what we have. Moses was later uh, commanded to appoint Joshua as his successor, Numbers 27. Verse 18 on, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. I sent him before Azar the priest, and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him. In their sight, you shall give some of your authority to him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He shall stand before Elazar the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Orim. At his word they shall go out, and his word they shall come in. He and all the children of Israel with him, and all the congregation. And Joshua and Elazar, the son of Aharon, the, the high, and the high priests, were commanded to take charge of the division of the land of Canaan. After it will have been conquered and subdued, they were to be in charge of dividing it amongst the tribes, and, and the tribes amongst the families within the tribes. See Numbers 34, 17. And Moses urged Joshua to be strong and faithful for the sake of the people. See Deuteronomy 31, 7. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and be of good courage. For you must go with his people to the land which the Lord has sworn to you, their fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And again, in Deuteronomy 34 it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord commanded him. We should notice that Joshua was to succeed, to follow after Moses. Joshua was to follow after Moses, to become the leader of the people after him. And the deeds and the practices of what Joshua did and his accomplishments are listed in the book of Joshua. And one thing that uh, someone pointed out, that, that the book of, uh, of Joshua seems to emphasize the parallelism between Joshua and Moses, uh, which is interesting, which is worth noting. So uh, we found this, actually we found, found this in, in Wikipedia, the Hebrew edition, the Hebrew version of Wikipedia, quotes were somewhere else, I couldn't find the source. It's not in the English version, but it, it seems to be quoting from somewhere else, all the parallelisms between Joshua and Moses. And then it shows Joshua as the successor of Moses, continuing in the path of Moses. Joshua is a, a leader and a guide, just as Moses was. Joshua is concerned the spiritual level of the people and with upholding their morale. Joshua split the Jordan River, just as Moses split the sea. It seems that the Jordan River, the Jordan River, actually once I was, uh, when I used to serve in the, uh, in the army, I mean, uh, every, most people in Israel served in the army, I did it. I served in the army, did a regular service, more or less, and then after that, uh, every every year for about a month, two weeks here, two weeks there, I served in the um, in the reserves. That means I had to do some type of uh, join the army, and I, we either did training, or we did guard duty, or we did something else. So one of our tasks, one time, was supposed to man a post overlooking the Jordan River. Okay, and we had there, we had a great big telescope about this big. And I could see people across the other side, see Jordan, Jordanian soldiers in the morning, getting up in the morning. They used to go out with their guns and hunt for birds. 
Now there's hardly any birds there. Also, I was once in one stage, I was also in Lebanon. I was in Lebanon a few times. And those in Lebanon, you hardly see any birds. Because the Arabs go around shooting them. Anything that moves, they shoot them. Dozens of birds don't survive in that area. Anyway, ah, so what was I taking? So at that same time, I was also learning the book of Joshua. And I uh, started looking at the topography of the river. Jordan, and it seems the River Jordan now, you, the River Jordan, you can almost jump across it, not jump, I'm exaggerating, but it's like a, a small stream, a small river, mainly, mainly because two-thirds of the water is taken by the Jordanians and the Israelis for irrigation before it even gets to anywhere. But even without that, it would not be very big. But you can see from the top, topography and hints in the Bible that at one stage it was quite large. In fact, it could have been enormous. You can see where it passes through valleys and so on, where the, the, uh, layer, where the banks have been cut away by, very sharply by streaming water. And that would make it a very large river. And apparently there was, the climate was different in those times. Everything was different in those times. When the Israelites first came to the land of Israel, there were forests everywhere. Much of it was forested, and it was colder, and there were bears and lions and wolves and all kinds of uh, wildlife and deer all over the place. And it was different, and uh, there has been, have been several climate changes since, and there may be climate changes in the future that will make the area more salubrious, more uh, better, better, better to live in. Even now it's not that bad. It's quite good actually, but that, that we'll see, wait and see how that will happen. So what was the point? Moses, just as Moses, just as Moses split the Red Sea for the Israelites to, to pass through it, so did Joshua split the River Jordan for the Israelites to pass over it. And also the angel appeared to Joshua at the beginning of his calling. See Joshua 5.13, just as God appeared to Moses in the burning bush at the beginning of his calling. Joshua sent spies to investigate the land of Israel. He sent two spies, just as Moses sent spies. Joshua fell on his face to employ salvation from God, see Joshua 7 6, just as Moses did in a similar situation. Joshua severely punishes the transgressors, Joshua 7 25, just as Moses did. Joshua led in conducting the ceremony of the blessing and curse in Mount Abel by, by Shem, near Shem. And the covenant, renewing the covenant between Israel and, um, and the Almighty. And this parallel similar ceremonies on a few occasions conducted by Moses. Joshua pointed with his staff towards the enemy in the battle of Ai. And this parallel of Moses pointing at it with his staff in the war against Amalek. Joshua strengthens the hearts of the leaders of the people going out to war. Uh, Joshua 1.25, it's also parallel Moses, Deuteronomy 31.7. And under the leadership of Joshua, the Israelites worshipped the Almighty just as they did in the time of Moses, see Joshua 24.31. When Joshua died, scripture referred to him as the servant of the Almighty, the servant of the Almighty, see Joshua 24.29. And this term had also been applied to Moses, see Deuteronomy 34.5. And then Joshua got fought for Israel, see Joshua 10.13. And just as Moses had calmed the people by telling them the Lord would fight for them, just before the cutting of the Red Sea. And uh, Joshua the Almighty saved Israel in a miraculous way, proud to that which had been done under Moses. And uh, so to we find that, that uh, Joshua even in some ways excels, did more than Moses did. See Joshua 10, it says, verse 12 onwards, Then Joshua that spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stands still over Gibeon, a moon in the valley of Ayalon. And so the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, and the people had their revenge. Upon their enemies, this is not written in the book of Joshua. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and it did not taste to go down for about a whole day. And there's not been no day like that before it offered after it. 
But the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So we see here that Joshua supplemented Moses, fulfilled the task of Moses, and parallel Moses. And uh, the book of, of, uh, of Joshua wants to emphasize this, wants us to tell us this and don't tell us this. And also that Joshua in some way will foreshadow Pia Dumbright, we are prototype for the future Messiah, son of Joseph, who begins to lead the Ten Tribes back, which work will be fulfilled, will be completed by the Messiah. Yako, you want to say something? Yes, I would love to celebrate the Pesach in the land, but this year it's not possible. Um, but I see uh, there's a website, and I will share it in the chat, the Torah. And it's also about what you shared here. I will qu quickly share it. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, it's the Torah.com and um, about Moses and Yeshua. Uh, ben Nun. Yeah, it's it's just it's, if someone wants to uh, look into that article, it's basically what you mentioned. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so the article, I've just written it. I'll probably send it out, send it a link to it. Today or tomorrow, a few okay, minor, okay. Uh, alterations and a lot I'm probably make to it, but it's, it's, it's uh, as good as it is. So it should be, but God willing, be uh, publicly publicly available to whoever wants to see it very soon. But um, maybe, as I'm from uh, the Northern Kingdom of the House of Israel, or I associate with the Northern Kingdom, since we. Uh, uh, speak here about the book of Joshua so maybe I can uh, have a call out to all the uh, Israelites from the northern kingdom like Joshua uh, in Joshua 5 to circumcise again <laughs> so that we can celebrate the Passover yeah so uh, um, I myself, I was uh, circumcised when I was 42 years old, and I read about um, uh, uh, our forefather Avram in Bereshit uh, 17, uh, lying on my bed and reading my Bible, and I see that that very same day, the Almighty spoke to our forefather Avram that very same day he was obedient but it took me like two years before i was obedient yeah so uh, it's a process yeah okay yeah so uh, the restoration of all the house of israel so but uh, as the almighty said uh, no one can partake of the pesach um, all the males uh, must be circumcised that uh, partake of the Pesach, yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, John, how are you? John, <laughs> you're on man. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, you okay? Well, yeah, I don't have a house now. I'm back on the street, um, but God is moving, okay? okay? And I'm watching your uh, French Revolution in, uh, you know, from live from Jerusalem. Be, be careful you don't get a dictator yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think the military will take over soon. Okay. Within, and within uh, uh, one man's whiskey is another man's poison. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, if people keep looking for a man to save them, they're going to be disappointed. You know, it's only God that can save us. He's our king. And he's our righteousness. Okay, whatever happens, we all have to do as well as we can according to the circumstances we find ourselves in. 
to yeah. and ask God to guide us, and right. he, he would do so. God willing, and may he also help you. Uh, I know it can be difficult. Uh, may God Almighty help you. May he help uh, all of us and uh, and uh, everyone here, and uh, all our families. So until uh, next time, uh, I'll see you all later. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Th Thanks, yeah. Thank you, Yair, and uh, for, for your time. And I'm glad you made Alia to uh, uh, um, address us from Jerusalem. Okay. Goodbye.